Welcome back to Pivot Point. I'm your host, Maya Rockymore. Before the break, we were actually talking about the disconnect, the growing divide between the Washington policy bubble and the rest of America. And so we're going to talk more about this theme in this segment with Adam Leos. He's a lawyer and policy advocate at Demos, where he focuses on policy advocacy to promote political equality and democratic fairness through safeguarding the right to vote and curbing the influence of big money on the political process. Welcome, Adam. Hi, thanks for having me, Maya. Thanks for coming on. Tell us about the report Demos released this week. Sure. Uh, we released a report called Stacked Deck, which, of course, you can find at uh, demos.org on the front page of our site. And basically, we make a few related points in this report. Um, one is that the wealthy have very different policy priorities and preferences than the rest of the general public. Uh, second, that government is, in fact, basically only responsive to the preferences of the wealthy and the preferences of the rest of us largely uh, make no difference whatsoever in terms of what policies the government does or doesn't um, uh, enact. And then we talk about, you know, a little bit about why this is the case in terms of the role of wealth uh, in the political system, uh, higher participation rates amongst the wealthy, and especially the role of money in politics. And we talk a bit about what we can do about this, how we can break this vicious cycle so that um, democracy can write the rules for capitalism and not the other way around. We're so, going to talk about the how in a second. Yeah, sure. But I do want to revisit this notion about how Washington has been captured by money interests. Uh, you know, the role of Citizens United, you point out in the report, uh, has had an outside influence on this. But it really uh, actually happened even before then, right? Sure, absolutely. Citizens United sort of put our big money system on steroids, but uh, there's been a, a long, to- long-running problem where a very, very tiny segment of the wealthiest folks in our population are giving the vast majority of the money to our candidates and now, of course, these uh, super PACs and outside spending groups. Um, and that really determines who gets in the game in the first place. It plays a filtering role. So it, it, when folks are thinking about, you know, can I make a run for Congress and really get in the game, mm-hmm. of course, the first question they have to ask themselves is, uh, how much money can I raise and where am I going to get that money? You know, do I have right. access to that network of wealthy donors? So this has been going on for a long time. Citizens United has made it worse. One of the things uh, that we pointed out in our our recent report called Billion Dollar Democracy was that, um, you know, all told combined, uh, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney uh, raised about $313 million from small donors. Mm -hmm. Those are folks giving less than $200. Right. But the top 32 super PAC donors... Um, we're able to match all of that giving. Wow. So it's a pretty, pretty sad statement about political voice in this country and how concentrated that voice is at the top and how the wealthy really have a megaphone uh, to scream and drown out the voices of the rest of us in the public. So, sphere. Adam, we're actually seeing this play out in real time. Uh, our show has focused a, a lot on what's happening to the social safety net, particularly social insurance programs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, conservative, wealthy conservative donors, particularly people like Pete Peterson, uh, the Business Roundtable, and others, uh, another coalition of, of high-level CEOs, multimillionaires and billionaires uh, called Fix the Debt Coalition. Uh, all of these folks have had an agenda to actually cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefits for Americans who, by the way, earn these benefits. Uh, and they have had so much influence that they seem to have co-opted mainstream media commentators. They seem to have co-opted policymakers on both sides of the partisan aisle. And, and despite Despite a historic re- election uh, where the American people rejected uh, the policies of Romney Ryan uh, that included that austerity kind of approach uh, to uh, social insurance cuts, uh, we're still seeing the politics enacted uh, where, you know, both the White House and Democrats and Republicans in Congress, some Democrats, not all, um, is important to point out, uh, have embraced this politics of austerity uh, that would hurt middle class and working class Americans. So this is a real time example of what you're talking about. Can you tell us about what other policy priorities there's a disconnect in? Sure, absolutely. And uh, it is a great example. And a lot of the key disconnects happen on kitchen table economic issues. So the you know debt you, uh, and austerity uh, deficits is a great example. Let's compare that to the priority that most average folks out in the communities place on getting their friends and neighbors back to work, right? So right. the wealthy are about three times likely 
to, more likely to list debt and deficits as a top priority uh, versus unemployment. And with the general public, it's, it's exactly flipped. Mm-hmm. And so why is it that we've been trapped in our Washington bubble here in a conversation about debt for the last year, and there's been really very little affirmative action on getting folks back into uh, get back into jobs. Longer than a those, year. It's yeah, been then, for the last then, five years, four yeah. years, yeah. And then also, I mean, let's also talk about the, the distinction between the minimum wage, which President Obama you know, put back on the agenda in his State of the Union, and capital gains taxes, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the vast majority of the public, nearly 80%, favor a minimum wage that's high enough such that no family with a full-time worker will fall below the poverty line. Right. But the wealthy don't favor that. It's actually only 40% of the wealthy that favor that. And we've seen, again, very little, hardly any action to boost the minimum wage and get folks above that poverty line. Contrast that with capital gains taxes. We know that capital gains is taxed at much lower rates than right. ordinary income. Americans broadly disagree with that. They would like to see it taxed at least as regular income. Mm-hmm. But in spite of that opposition from the general public, Congress has lowered capital gains taxes in 1997, again in 2001, again in 2003. So consistent congressional action that tracks the policy preferences and the priorities of the wealthy in opposition to what the general public is pushing for. And it really underlines... You know, there's a, a, a political scientist named Martin Gillens at Princeton, uh, and we, d- we really drew on his research for this report. And he concluded, you know, this is not a, a, a policy advocate, but, mm-hmm. but a state econ- uh, political science professor who concluded that, quote, under most circumstances, the preferences of the vast majority of Americans appear to have essentially no impact on what policy the government does or doesn't adopt. Wow. And I think those examples are sad commentaries and sort of underline that basic point, and that's why we feel like we've, we're in this vicious cycle where when the wealthy are able to capture our political system, translate their economic might directly into political power, and then, of course, that leads to policies which only further concentrates wealth and completes the cycle. So it becomes, uh, the, the, the Democratic uh, governing apparatus actually becomes an extended part of their business strategy uh, yeah. that has a positive uh, impact on their bottom line and ends up uh, increasing the wealth divide. Exactly. And we need to find ways to break that and reverse that cycle to make it a virtuous cycle where we have increasing power for average citizens over big money. And then we have more a more fair economy where working uh, class folks can get ahead and where middle class families can be secure uh, instead of worry that they're one uh, job loss or sickness or paycheck away from falling back out of the So how do we do line. that? Because we need to be talking, not only just talking about jobs, but we need to be creating jobs. We need to be getting our economy back on practice, uh, uh, on, on track. We don't need to be embracing austerity economics at this point in time. Uh, and so what are the recommendations that the report makes uh, in terms of how Americans get their power back? Sure. Well, you know, we, I think we need to really start by acknowledging that if you care about a fair economy, then you need to care about the role of money in politics and the role of citizens in engaging in their government. So, you know, I think it starts with limiting the role of big money and empowering average citizens on our political process. Um, We also, and we have a set of specific recommendations in the report for how to do that, but we also need to focus on our broken voting system. You know, President Obama commented on the long lines, but that's only a symptom of much larger problems where voting is not... Um, easy and accessible for many Americans. There are barriers that have been put in front of folks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one ex- simple example is that uh, we should be uh, having folks able to register to vote on the same day that they vote. There's mm-hmm. no reason in this day and age to not have that. And the number one reason why people don't vote is because they missed the voter registration deadline. So we need to make the voter registration system much less arcane um, and, and cut the red tape and give folks the freedom to vote uh, that they deserve. And then we need to um, really get a handle on our corporations, right? So Citizens United um, you know, unleashed the role of corporate wealth and power directly into our political process. By claiming that corporations are people, too. <laughs> yes, and by underlining that longstanding claim uh, uh, in the courts. And um, that has presented a lot of problems across the board. Of course, we created corporations to... Uh, act in the public interest, right, and to create economic um, uh, 
power and wealth for the for, the, for average citizens, not just for a concentrated set of managers at the top. So we need to enact policies that will allow us to once again uh, grab the reins and, and get a hold of these very powerful economic players that ultimately are supposed to be chartered in the public interest. So we and see we see policies enacted. Remember uh, McCain Feingold, uh, yeah. you know, and we're right now as we speak, uh, the Supreme Court is trying to gut the Voting Rights Act. Um, yes. We've seen policies enacted. We've seen, you know, there's been a lot of activism over the years to expand the franchise in America. And yet time and again, it seems to be that no matter what you put into place, that co-optation, is, it becomes insidious and, and it uh, the, the value of whatever is done erodes over time. Uh, and so how do we protect against that? Well, I mean, it's a constant battle, right? So I actually think you could look at American history as a slow and achingly slow and frustrating uh, move towards political equality, right? Where we've right. expanded the franchise. We have, um, you know, through the Voting Rights Act and through the Reconstruction Amendments, et cetera. And so we're on a journey and, and we're not there by any means, as the you know the, uh, the our big money politics has shown, as the attack on the Voting Rights Act shows, and it, it's a long and hard journey. But I think it's a forward-looking journey, and so it, it's never. I don't think we're ever we're likely to get to a set of policies that solve these problems once and for all. Um, although I hope we do, and I can retire, and <laughs> and I'll see you on a sunny beach somewhere. But <laughs> I think it's more likely that you know we need to continue the generational fight that uh, heroes like John Lewis have, have pioneered before us. And we can get, we can make improvements. And the way that we can make improvements uh, is both by protecting the protections that we have. So the Voting Rights Act, obviously, is you know it's absurd that given all that's transpired just in this past year's election, that folks would suggest that's no longer necessary. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. We need to protect the, what we have. And then more importantly, I think we need to be looking at the kind of transformative policies that will really shift power relations in this country mm -hmm. and give. Some of the some of or, or all of the power back to ordinary citizens right. and take it away from the concentrated um, um, wealth that we have right now. And so I think that on the money and politics front, you know, we need broadly speaking two sets of policies. We do need to address not just Citizens United, but as you pointed out, the problems are longstanding. So we need to either amend the Constitution to make perfectly clear once and for all that the First Amendment was never intended for use as a tool by the wealthy and powerful to dominate our political process. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not what the founders intended, so mm -hmm. all we have to do is clarify that. If we don't, or we can go through the courts, right, as we have uh, turnover amongst judges and justices, the next generation of justices that's appointed to the Supreme Court absolutely has to understand this like average citizens do and not like a very tiny minority of corporatists and, and sort of orthodox libertarians that we have in the conservative majority. Right. So that's one set of policies that will allow us to clamp down on big money. And while we're doing that, we need to focus on policies that em empower average citizens. Yeah. So there's some great um, bills that have been introduced in Congress right now that would match the contributions of an ordinary citizen, five to one, ten to one, changes the incentives of, of candidates and who they talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, we can provide tax credits for small political contributions and or vouchers so that every citizen's got $100 in his or her pocket or, or a card to distribute to the kinds of candidates and causes that, that motivate that citizen right. and get people involved in the process. So there's lots of things we can be doing now to move us in the right direction. We might not have a silver bullet, but it's a fight that I think is absolutely essential for the fate of our democracy. I actually so we think that we need to have universal uh, voter registration. Uh, yes, that that's a great point. Why should the burden be on the citizen, right? right? Why not have flip that script entirely? Place it, we all interact with, you know, most of us interact with the state or federal government in various ways. Our information is already being con collected in lots of different contexts. Mm -hmm. So why not have that go on to the voter registration rules unless we, for some reason, choose to affirmatively opt out. So I totally agree with that. Adam, many people don't realize how Washington works. Uh, I worked on the Hill. Have you worked on the Hill? I'm not sure. Uh, no, I was. Yeah. A, I worked as a lobbyist for a public interest group, but uh, okay. never. But never you've been in Washington, it. so you know how yeah. this works. Uh, the people with influence, lobbyists, wealthy individuals, they get to knock on the doors of Congress. They need. They get to have personal meetings with the uh, Congress people and their staff. They also get another bite at the apple through fundraisers. 
Congress uh, by giving money. Uh, they get to sit at the table uh, with a member of Congress and talk about their policy issues and their preferred strategies uh, for enacting policy. Uh, they also hobnob with these people. They rub elbows with these people at parties uh, mm -hmm. on the circuit. And so, you know, you have super empowered individuals uh, having regular access to people in power and not just policymakers, but also media figures. Uh, and, and what that does is it, it, it serves to kind of reinforce the bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, because what they're uh, what the, the decision makers are hearing uh, is kind of like the one track perspective and not necessarily um, the views of the public. So any la final parting thoughts? I'd also like for you to share with us a little bit about Demos and your website. Sure. Uh, I would just say what you said is exactly the reason why it's so important that we break that bubble and get our members of Congress to spend more time focused on their constituents. Uh, and so if we can turn knocking on doors and talking to your constituents into an effective fundraising activity for, co for members of Congress by you know, matching that $100 contribution to make it into a $500 or $1,000 mm. contribution, that can change that um, the dynamic that you describe, and so that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, but to close up and talk about Demos, I mean, we we're a, a public policy organization working for an America in which we all have an equal say in our democracy and mm -hmm. an equal chance in our economy. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is that as this report lays out, we very much see the political ta the takeover of our politics by the wealthy and the stalled economic mobility that results as intimately connected, and we really exist to break that uh, uh, vicious cycle and to turn it around so that ordinary citizens are getting opportunities to just make a better life and get a fair shot in the economy, and of course, have their voices heard. So well, thank you. I, hmm. Thank you for all of the great work that you do at Demos. Uh, uh, pr appreciate you having us on, and folks can check out demos.org to see all of our reports, including Stack Deck, which is on the front page. I've really enjoyed speaking to you this morning, Adam. Likewise. Adam Leos, lawyer and policy advocate at Demos. You're listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rockymore, brought to you by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. We'll be right back after the break.